like to welcome all of you to our satellite session today, which is part of the CUGH Annual Conference 2021. And we are happy that so many of you are joining us today from all around the world for this online event, um, which will present various regional and global perspectives on climate change and health with a special focus on adaptation and mitigation solutions. This event is organized by the Global Network of Science Academies called IAP in collaboration with the regional networks of science academies in Europe, Asia, Africa, and the Americas. You will hear a little more about IAP and its regional networks shortly. Before we start with the presentations, I would like to introduce you to our speakers and our agenda for today. Um, I will stop sharing my screen for this so you can get an idea of who we have here. Um, we have Professor Andy Haynes. Andy, if you could turn on your video so that everyone can see you for a second. Um, Andy Haynes, Professor of Environmental Change and Public Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and one of the two co-chairs of our IEP project on climate change. He's also currently the co-chair of the Lancet Pathfinder Commission on Health in the Zero Carbon Economy. Then next up, we have Dioraj Kursi. Dioraj, could you turn on your video for a second? Dioraj is an epidemiologist from Mauritius who will be representing NASEC, the African Network of Science Academies today. Next up, we have Ish Ishmael Koyunchu. Um, Ismail, if you could turn on your camera for a second. Professor Koyunchi is president of the Istanbul Technical University and member of the Turkish Academy of Sciences and will be representing ASA, the Asian Network of Science Academies today. We also have Robin Fierce. Robin Fierce is the scientific coordinator of the IEP project on climate change and health and also director of the biosciences program of ESEC, the European Network of Science Academies. We also have with us today, Shirley Harper. Shirley is a Canada Research Chair in Climate Change and Health and an Associate Professor in the School of Public Health at the University of Alberta. She will be representing IANAS today, the Network of Science Academies in the Americas. And last but not least, we have Professor Volker Tamun. He is a virologist by training. He is the current president of the Inter-Academy Partnership and chairman of the Biosciences Steering Panel um, at ESEC, which is the European Network of Science Academies, and he's the other co-chair of our IAP project on climate change and health. During the breakout sessions later, you will also get to meet some of our colleagues from IAP and, IAP and ESEC who will help us with moderating and reporting. Now I would like to share with you our agenda for today. As you can see, our uh, program today is divided into three parts. In the first part, we will listen to presentations given by our regional representatives on climate change and health in the different world regions. We will also have a short panel discussion during this part. Then we will have a short break. In this break, we ask you to switch to a second separate Zoom meeting. I will explain this later to enable us to host breakout discussions so that we can get into an actual discussion with you. And then for the last part, we will come together again in this webinar to hear about what was discussed in the meeting and the other breakout sessions and to come to a conclusion. Before we start with the presentations, I would also share with you a few technical remarks. Um, Please use the regular chat uh, for general queries, or if you have IT queries, you can see the chat bar in the lower part of your screen on the left. If you have any questions to the speakers or would like to know a bit more about their presentations, please use the Q&A tool, which you will find on the right-hand side. Please don't be shy to ask questions. Our speakers are very happy to answer any of your, the questions you may have. Uh, for the presentations. You can do that at any time during the pre presentations, after the presentations, just use this Q&A tool for that. And um, I already said that for the breakout sessions, we will need a separate link. This will be shared in the chat, which you will also um, 
which you can open by clicking on the chat symbol. Um, the very last um, item I would like to mention before we start um, is that now I talked a bit about ourselves, but since this is a webinar and it's said that we cannot actually see you, we would like to know a bit about you. And for this, I prepared um, three short questions. First, I would like to know from you where you are from. Um, so I will share with you now, just if you could give a short, quick answer so we know who is in the room today. Okay, I will, not everyone has answered yet, but I will just finish the survey for now. Um, so we see that 35% are joining us from North America. We have 20% from Asia, 27% from Europe, uh, some from the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa. No one from Oceania, but I guess this is also due to the inconvenient time difference. Now, just a short second question I would like to know is where do you work and what is your field of work? So we know what is the background, professional background of our attendees. Okay, so the overwhelming majority is from academia. We also have a few representatives of national governments and national agencies and net NGOs are also part and also a few representatives from industry. And now the very last question is with regard to your expectations for this webinar. What are the reasons that you joined this webinar? What do you wish to gain from it? Okay, so answers are quite mixed. I'm assuming uh, many people also clicked on more than one option. So generally a better understanding of how climate change affects health in different world regions, and also the wish to gain new ideas and approaches for adaptation and mitigation strategies. So I hope that we can meet some of these expectations um, now during our webinar. And with this, I would like to um, hand the word or give the floor, so to say, to our first presenter, which is uh, Professor Volker um, Tjemmühl. Okay. Can I start, Johanna? The floor is yours. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Dear colleagues, it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you participating in this webinar. Although I assume you have been using this technology a lot since we started fighting the COVID pandemic, for me, it is still a strange situation and I did not get used to it. To have no personal contact with the audience that we are addressing in our workshop. Today, we want to discuss with you our project on climate change and health. But before we start, I would like to introduce to UIAP the Interacademy Partnership. Since probably not all of you are familiar with this global network of academies of science, medicine, and engineering. IAP was founded in 1993 with the idea to bring all the national academies of science, medicine, and engineering together so that their voices are not only heard at home on a national level but also regionally and if possible, globally. 
The first office of IAP was at the Royal Society in the UK. After the move of IAP's headquarters from London to Trieste in Italy, to the Academy of Sciences for the Developing World, four regional networks of IAP member academies were founded. And in the next slide, you can see how they are distributed. There are a network in Asia, which is the um, Association of Academies and Societies of Sciences in Asia. You can see them on the right-hand side. Then in the middle, you will have ESAC, European Academy Science Advisory Council of Europe. And then in Africa, you have the network of African science academies. And on the left-hand side, you see the North and South Americas, IANES, which is the Inter-American Network of Academies of Sciences. And uh, in these uh, networks, the regional activity is grouped together. And altogether, we have 140 member academies, which then represent more of about 30,000 leading scientists and engineers, a high concentration of knowledge, and of course, health professionals, as well in over 100 countries. Now, in the next slide, you can see what are our priorities? And these priorities are actually four different areas. To build the capacity of our member academies and regional networks, and this includes many things. For example, that our academies represent women scientists and younger scientists and scientists from different backgrounds as well. That there's support for the engagement with wider civil society, policy makers and media, or providing platforms for an exchange of good practice by the academies in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, for example. And the second, so the idea was and the strategic boy team is giving us authoritative and independent advice. And this, of course, is very important, important from a science point of view, that it means empowering our academy to engage on different topics that are of relevance to society and to its sustainable development on the basis of the best independent and up-to-date scientific understanding. But we also are interested, as you can see in the slides, to commun communicate the importance of science to our societies. IAPs has been doing this successfully for many years, where, for example, one successful and highly inspiring programs on the need for good science education in schools over many years. And of course, our engagement on societal issues, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, from the perspective of science, underscores the importance that we attribute to science as a vital pillar of any sustainable society. And lastly, IAP strives to be a well-functioning, progressive and resilient network of its members. This may be sounds trivial to you, but given the global nature of our organization, it is not. A lot of intracultural learning takes place in IAP. And I think this kind of learning, the globe will need to achieve a sustainable future for humanity. After many years in IAP, I can say that I'm very happy about this global path taken by all the academies together. I will give you some example of our activities in relation to this strategic priority. And on the next slide, you can see that we have dealt with, of course, in the pandemic, with COVID-19. And IAP has put a group together by sending a call to all our member academies. And we got about 80 experts together from the different bioscience and medical fields, which are coming together, giving advice to IAP, to the member academies, which have problems. And uh, this group is, is shared by three women as quotients. We also have um, in our website, the possibility that our academies can not only consult, but only provide their important findings, which are of interest our networks. And in the, net, in the next, next slide, you can see 
that we also started an IAP community on the development of the solution of vaccine against COVID-19. We all experience right now that there is not enough vaccine available globally. And that certain countries you now try to keep them for themselves and not trying to share them with others. And this probably will only be solved once we have more or a surplus of vaccine, but this will certainly take a while. And of course, in this, in this context, we only are not only addressing this issue, but also fighting fake vaccine um, medicines and also fake news, something which is so important that science is getting in contact with these questions. And I can tell you some additional IAP communiques we have published uh, over the last month and also last year. We had a call for global solidarity when we realized, for example, in March last year, that every country was only concentrating on its own problem and it was entirely forgotten that the pandemic was a global event. And in contrast to the Ebola situation where we had a leading country like the US at that time to, to have a concentrated action in the pandemic, we failed. And this was something we were aware of and we, we then published and, and uh, put pressure on different organizations. We also had to publish uh, achieving the public health potential of COVID-19 vaccine, how important it is that medicine plays an important role and we don't have to go into further detail with this. Or we had a community on the global green recovery after COVID-19. In other words, that we all already raised questions when the, the, the pandemic is really coming to an end, or we see light, not only light in the tunnel, but that things are improving. That we, have our, we should not forget that we have a climate problem which has to be addressed and we can learn something from COVID which could be recrutified by our climate situation. And the next slide, I can show you that there, we also gave you know, some advice in science education. Together with the Smithsonian Institute in the US, we produced documents on food and nutrition security. We addressed also, for example, the mosquito situation when we had the Sika virus infection in South America. Something which I think is important that scientists don't forget that it would be good to, to educate young people so that they get not only interested in science, but that also the information of science is spread in a, in a wider society. Next slide, please. So in addition, of course, we also you now take to enlarge our group and our membership. We are, only, we are also trying to start new academies in developing countries, and we have new members, as you can see, in Algeria, Rwanda, Tunisia, which just have joined our activity. Next slide. Now, I mentioned in the beginning that the regional networks were actually started that in the region, in the continent, also science work together and addresses together important issues which are of, of interest to society, but also in particular of government and politics. And I also mentioned that we, we are trying in IAP to bring these regional networks together so that important global questions are addressed together by the four regional networks, by these four huge continents, so that they bring in their knowledge and, and that this knowledge is available, not only regional, but, but globally. And um, we started a couple of years ago a topic of food and nutrition security and agriculture. And what we wanted to achieve was to have four regional reports on the same issues. Issues means in this way that we define 10 major scientific questions which are important globally for food and nutrition security and agriculture. And we discuss this together. These region produce reports, regional reports, four reports on this issue. And out of the four reports, we, we produce a fifth report, a global report, in which these 10 questions and the answers, in particular the answers and responses and the suggestions of scientific uh, uh, advice giving to these problems 
were compared. And it was an eye opening for, of course, for politics to see that these questions were, were in a different way answered, depending on the region, depending on the situation in the region, and depending on the country. And this was quite an eye opener to politics. And I just can say, for example, that with the report, at least four regional reports, plus the global report, we were invited by a few years ago to, uh, to the S20 meeting in Argentina, where we presented this to politics and to a great audience. And also, the United Nations is still interested in this because IFP has been invited this year to participate at the UN summit on food safety and food security, which takes place at the end of the year. And we are asked to give an update of our reports so that it is up to date and can be used and presented there. So, may I have the next slide? This is actually what I wanted to tell you. I hope we will have a very interesting discussion. Climate change and health is a similar project like food and nutrition. And Robin Pierce, I think, will give you all the details of what we are doing in, in relation to climate change and health right now with our networks of IAP. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Tamil, for this uh, short introduction to IAP. And with this, I will give the floor, so to say, um, to Robin Fears. Um, and for this, I will share my screen once again so we can um, listen to his presentation on our global IAP project. Hello to everybody. I'm Robin Fears. I'm based in the UK. Uh, and please let me first join in welcoming you all to this satellite event. You've already heard something about uh, the Inter-Academy Partnership, IAP. My purpose in this presentation is to introduce you to our global project on climate change and health. It's based on the activities of four regional groups who will all be presenting later in this session. Our, our aim is to share knowledge between the different regions and stimulate discussion with you all. Our focus is particularly on the diverse solutions for mitigating and adapting to climate change for health in order to protect and promote human health. Okay, this slide is taken from the work of the US CDC and portrays the diversity climate change challenges we will face. Various exposure pathways, diverse effects on health. Other presenters will describe many of these risks and how we should respond to them at the regional level. What this slide doesn't show is the particular vulnerable groups because of geography or socioeconomic status or something else. And we'll also discuss those during the course of our presentations. Broadly, we categorize climate change effects and, and exposures in, in three categories. Direct effects, for example, from extreme heat. Indirect effects mediated by ecosystems. So for example, changes in agriculture. And thirdly, indirect effects mediated by socioeconomic system changes, for example, declining labour productivity. You'll hear lots about these later on. Now, in terms of the IAP project, in summary, this is a, a global scale. It's based on four regions, Africa, Asia, the Americas and Europe. And the work from these regions is being used to engage at national and regional level with stakeholders, scientific community more broadly, and other stakeholders. In addition, our regional outputs will also be used as a shared resource for generating a global analysis and synthesis. The project is co-chaired by Volker Tumerlin and Andy Haynes, who are also speaking today. Okay, clearly, there's a lot of other a lot of other groups involved in these areas on climate change and health. Uh, many excellent groups delivering important recommendations. On some of these same issues. So, how does our IAP approach add value? I want to emphasise the inclusivity. We're inclusive across diverse scientific disciplines, taking a transdisciplinary approach. We're integrating analysis and activity at local, regional, global levels. Uh, we focus on vulnerable groups, indigenous people, and other local activities. We're also inclusive in involving younger researchers. And our project over the next couple of years 
serves also as a basis for longer term follow up in engagement and analysis. So that's what we are. This is our membership. I just want to remind you again, you've probably already seen this, of the global scale. And we're able to bring together diverse perspectives from across the world in two main areas. That, that is, what do we need to do to build a robust scientific evidence base and share that knowledge worldwide? And secondly, how best can we use that evidence to inform policy and practice? So there are our objectives. And although worldwide we share uh, challenges for climate change and health, clearly there's a great diversity both within and between regions. So in order to generate coherence for our project, the four regional work streams in Africa, Asia, Americas and Europe agreed some common starting points to describe the effects of climate change on health in their own regions, to focus particularly on what the solutions might be for adaptation and mitigation. Mitigation is reducing greenhouse gases, uh, which in some cases brings co-benefits for health that we'll talk about, and adaptation is adapting to the effects of those, those effects of climate change that cannot otherwise be mitigated. So our focus is on solutions, but in order to derive solutions, we also need to improve and share the evidence base. We need to link the work locally, globally, and regionally. And we need to link also what we're doing with other current policy initiatives. Uh, sustainable development goals are perhaps one of the best examples of, of large initiatives elsewhere. But in addition, in, in this year, we're looking forward to COP26 of the UN FCCC and the U UN Food Systems Summit. Uh, there's a number of relevant activities at the international policy level. I won't go into further details as to what we've actually done or, or are doing, uh, because you'll hear that very soon from the other speakers. I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes instead uh, providing a little bit more of general context to the project and our objectives. And first, uh, this slide from the Climate Action Track Group Worldwide, uh, I want to look at some of the issues for mitigation to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and achieve the targets within the Paris Agreement for a 1.5 degree centigrade or, or maybe a two degree centigrade world. This slide uh, lists some of the uh, near term priorities for mitigation by action on, on fossil fuels, uh, transport, agriculture, uh, building, renovation, and, and so on. My point is that when considering these options for mitigation, it's very important also to include the consideration of the near-term health go benefits in these mitigation actions in order to help prioritise decision-maker focus on what can be done now. For, for example, phasing out fossil fuel combustion, in addition to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, will also decrease air pollution. And as a consequence of that decreasing air pollution will bring early benefits to health, uh, for example, diminution of respiratory and cardiovascular disease, uh, development disorders, and, and so on. The, these are near-term health benefits, particularly for the group locally engaging in the mitigation action, and they complement the longer term benefits arising from global warming itself. Now, you'll hear more about these co-benefits in various areas in, in the next few presentations. And my other main point is to observe that we live in a world with converging crises of climate change and COVID-19 at the moment. But both these crises, that is climate change and COVID-19, have found the world unprepared. There have been very high public health and economic costs for both crises. And in some respects, there are interactions, for example, at the level of food supply um, or emergency responsiveness. My point is that in planning for a sustainable recovery after COVID-19, we, we now have a singular opportunity 
to convince policymakers to take the opportunity to look for and plan for benefits for health, the environment, and equity, in addition to the economic benefits that will be expected to arise from a recovery. Now, this slide shows um, public opinion survey uh, noting very high levels of public support for a green economic recovery from COVID-19 uh, around the world. And collectively, we in the scientific community have a responsibility to help keep informing with our science, monitoring and auditing the policy actions in order to sustain um, the green economic recovery. Uh, okay, so in conclusion, just coming back to the purpose of this session, over the next few minutes, you will hear the evidence from the four regions uh, as to what we've been doing in this project. We very much want to stimulate feedback and discussion with you in the audience, both during our Q&A sessions and in the breakout sessions that you'll be participating in later on. In order to provide feedback to the members of the project on the, with regard to the ongoing directions for the project, and in particular to bring attention to bear, what more evidence do we need? How can we prioritize the solutions in terms of adaptation and mitigation? What are the common issues at the global level? What varies between the regions? And how can we all work together? So I finish this presentation. I thank you uh, for your attention. And I thank our sponsor in the German government I also mentioned that uh, the next short presentation will also be by me when I will go on to describe some of our work in Europe. So thank you for your attention so far. Yes, thank you, Robin, for, um, for this short presentation. And now we will go right into the first region, which is the European, so the, the European region and in order for you to view this, I need to share my screen again, which I will do just now. And just to encourage you, if you have any questions to the speakers, just write your questions in the Q&A and we'll come back to those later on um, during the discussion and the feedback round. So following on from my previous presentation about IAP, I now want to spend a few minutes uh, giving the perspective from Europe on the issues that I mentioned regarding climate change and health. In this presentation, I draw on the work by ESAC, that is the European Academy's Science Advisory Council. And the work by ESAC started uh, earlier than in the other regions and the actual report has been published a year or so ago uh, and is available on the ESAC website. So I commend this report to you um, for detail on, on the points that I'll be presenting and on a, a number of other topics. What did we find in our ESAC work? This slide summarizes uh, four main areas for recommendations to policymakers in Europe. Um, we, we advised um, much more needed to be done to link the outputs from research with the development of policies, uh, particularly in terms of finding solutions, adaptation and mitigation, and doing it in a coherent way so that we minimize unintended spillovers or consequences of that in, in one area on another area. So linking, secondly, communication, um, from the scientific community in order to inform uh, behavior at the individual, company, institutional level, and, and also countering both misinformation and indeed disinformation in this area. Scientific community has a responsibility to clarify and engage. In, in thinking about how we can use evidence for policy development, that there's two points, but my last two bullets. One is we must all already do better in using the evidence that's available now um, to make the case for health in all policies across sectors, 
across disciplines and of course aligned with policy initiatives, initiatives that are already underway. And we have a number of those in Europe. But in addition, we need to generate new evidence that is to fill the knowledge gaps so that we can better inform policy and practice using the best research. Um, and one of the areas where we need to fill knowledge in Europe and elsewhere is on some of the vulnerable groups. And I'll come back to that in a minute. In my following slides, I'll exemplify two areas from our ESAC report where we have been generating and using the knowledge. So first example is in agriculture and food and nutrition security. Now in Europe as well as where climate change is already damaging food and nutrition security. How should we respond to those adverse effects, both in terms of mitigation and adaptation? Well, in Europe, the effects of climate change on agriculture do vary uh, across the continent and are projected to continue doing so. In some areas, for example, crop yields may even increase because of warmer climate. But overall, for the European region, we do find current decrease, decrease in uh, yield of cereals, for example, and in both yield and nutritional quality for fruit and vegetables. Uh, and these, change, these adverse changes are expected to continue. There's multiple pathways for these adverse effects. Uh, it's not just increasing heat and drought, but it's also, for example, increasing the distribution of pests and diseases for both crops and livestock. And remember, um, the effects on agriculture in Europe may be exacerbated um, by a reduction in food imports from the rest of the world is affected even more severely by climate than is Europe. Well, it's a, it's a complex situation. Uh, again, I summarise it in, in the first bullet. We're already seeing changes in uh, cereal, fruit and vegetable quality. Uh, the pathways are complex. Um, what can we do about this in terms of adaptation? Well, that there's some great scientific opportunities to develop climate resilient agriculture. Um, our ESAP report goes into the detail. I want to give just one example here, uh, drawn from biosciences research, and in particular, the new genomic technologies such as genome editing that can underpin the development of improved crop varieties resistant to biotic and abiotic stresses. These promise to provide a major contribution to climate resilient agriculture, but they require not just cutting edge research, we have that, they also require a supportive regulatory framework to encourage innovation in the new breeding techniques. Europe currently does not have this, so we have a disconnect between our ability to do the science and the ability to turn that into innovation and connect to practice for improved agriculture. Also, adaptation is, is not enough in this area. Agriculture itself contributes in a major way to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, approximately 30% of the total greenhouse gas emissions worldwide are contributed by um, agriculture itself and land use changes associated with agriculture. A high proportion of that comes from livestock farming. The co contribution from agriculture can be mitigated and will make a big contribution to mitigating total greenhouse gas. A number of options are possible. Clearly, we need to reduce food waste. Uh, we need to improve farming practices in various ways. Uh, and there are examples of good practice that we can share. Uh, and also, we need to consider a particular focus on those areas of farming that are contributing most to greenhouse gas emissions. And in Europe, that's livestock and dairy farming. So that in Europe, attempts to decrease the consumption of red meat when that is excessive in populations and adopting more plant-based diets serve as a means to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from livestock and in addition, 
also provide a means to capture the health benefits because of the reduced incidence of non-communicable diseases that would be connected to reduced red meat intake. Now, the, these propositions for Europe may not be applicable everywhere, of course, and we do need to act to protect vulnerable groups um, who may already have low intakes of micronutrients. And of course, in other regions, uh, the debate is also quite complex in terms of uh, customizing diets to appropriate circumstances. My second example is infectious disease in Europe. Um, these also are showing significant changes currently in association with climate change. Uh, and the adverse consequences are projected also to increase. Um, there are examples of diverse pathogens affected by climate change. In many cases, the exposure pathway is via an increased distribution of the vector or pathogen, um, but other climate effects can exacerbate uh, these broader changes. For example, flooding may produce uh, local and transient uh, additional environments for uh, vectors. This, this slide taken from the uh, European ECDC uh, focuses on, on West Nile virus. Um, the data are at the end of last year and show a, a continuing trend for expansion of West Nile virus across the European region. Um, the incidence and the distribution do vary from year to year, um, but over the last few years, there has broadly been a, a continuing westward and northward expansion of West Nile virus, and that will continue uh, throughout Western and Northern Europe. Probably. Tackling the growing challenges from infectious disease requires multiple approaches to adaptation, um, requires better monitoring and early warning systems, for example, and there are uh, ways of instituting and sharing good practice in early warning systems. It also requires renewed commitment to novel diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. In my next slide, I, I mention a particular concern with regard to the Arctic region. Um, this recent publication came from a workshop uh, organized jointly by ESAC with the, U the US academies and IAP to focus on microbial threats in the Arctic, in particular, the potential re-emergence of anthrax from thawing permafrost in the Arctic, and the Arctic is, is warming at a rate much greater than some other regions. So potential emergence of anthrax and also identification of previously unknown bacteria and viruses in the Arctic. In addition, the rapid warming of the Arctic is associated with potential for spreading uh, previously established infectious diseases, including tick-borne diseases, malaria, West Nile virus, and Vibrio species. These changes present problems for the indigenous communities across the Arctic region, but also to their neighbours and, and potentially globally. The conclusions from our discussions on the Arctic are obviously of great relevance to, to the community in the Arctic, but also we feel maybe generalizable for elsewhere in Europe and indeed the rest of the world. Uh, and, and these conclusions are discussed in detail in, in the workshop report. But broadly, we emphasize the need to engage with local communities and use local knowledge, uh, the need for better surveillance, and that may include taking a, a One Health approach to surveying and responding to disease, both in public health and in animals, for livestock or at wildlife. Um, it's important in, in the disparate area that represents the Arctic to share research data and technologies uh, and work together um, across a number of different countries in the region. It's also important to use those emerging data to inform policy in the different countries of the Arctic region 
and overall uh, in collective ende endeavours in the Arctic. And finally, I want to emphasise the importance of investing in basic research. Um, there are a number of issues um, for infectious diseases in the Arctic. We need to know more about the determinants of transmission, both within species and between species, and the determinants of pathogenicity. Of course, the, these objectives are highly relevant, not just for the diseases described in the Arctic, but also, for example, uh, in our recent experience on COVID-19, where there's a great need to understand determinants of transmission much better for COVID-19 and for preparedness for future pandemics. And let's move through to my last slide, um, which tries to bring together some of the issues for the converging crises of climate change and COVID-19 that, that I mentioned previously. In, in some respects, they, they share common issues. Both crises revealed a lack of preparedness in many of our countries. Both have disproportionate effects on vulnerable groups. Um, the effects may be compounded by climate change and COVID-19 together. Um, there are, of course, relevant issues for uh, the, the next generation of novel pathogens, whatever they may be. But fi finally, on this slide, I want to emphasize there's also an opportunity, the opportunity to put in place post COVID-19 sustainable recovery options to gain benefits, not just for economic recovery, which we all want, but also for health, equity and the environment uh, to tackle climate change and the other environmental consequences. As I showed in my previous PowerPoint presentation, there is public support for pursuing these low carbon pathways post COVID-19. And we do now have an opportunity and a responsibility in the scientific community to act with urgency to advise our decision makers on how they can move forward. So I finish here. Thank you very much again. Yes, thank you, Robin, uh, for also this second presentation on the European perspective. Um, and now I would, we will move forward to listen to the Asian perspective presented by Ismail um, Kuyunchu, and I will also share my screen for that. Just one second. Yes. Um, and as always, uh, you're welcome to write any questions uh, in the Q&A tool, and we will address those right after this presentation on Asia. My name is Ismail Koyuncu. I'm the member of Turkish Academy of Sciences, and also I'm the president of Istanbul Technical University. And I am the member of Climate Change and Health Commission of us. Today, I will talk about regional perspective from Asia on climate change and health. Uh, there was a meeting a year ago in February 2020 in Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur. Uh, scientists from different regions of uh, Asia attended to this uh, meeting and we discussed climate change and health in uh, ASA countries. And now we are preparing a report uh, uh, for as uh, us, uh, and uh, this report will almost uh, will finish uh, in very soon. Uh, as I said, this spread continent with extremes uh, of climate, and therefore a variety of health effects from climate change. And some countries are relatively less affected and uh, to those which are severely impacted. There are different multiple pathways and effects, direct heat effects, uh, for example, on cardiovascular uh, disease, indirect heat effects on labor productivity, and flooding infectious disease. And air pollution is very important in Asia uh, due to the burning of forest and pollution, and also uh, migration of uh, vectors and pathogens from neighboring countries and mental health, allergy, food and nutrition. So these are all 
very important in uh, Asia countries. Air pollution is major uh, public health uh, issue in uh, Asia countries. Uh, the sources of air pollution, you know, is coming mostly from the fossil fuels uh, and wildfires and uh, agricultural practices. Uh, there are some uh, solutions, case studies in uh, Asia uh, countries uh, to decrease the effect of air pollution. Uh, for example, renewable energy uh, production uh, and also using another uh, uh, issues for fossil uh, fuels and prevention of forest fires and also uh, decrease the uh, air pollution from uh, public transportation. Australia uh, experienced very big uh, wildfire in 2019 and 2020. Uh, the scale and intensity of the, uh, this uh, virus is in presence and opportunity to uh, address the knowledge gap. Flooding is also an increasing problem through Asia region. And uh, in uh, most uh, countries, uh, because of uh, flooding uh, at uh, short term, bottom bone and water bone diseases and the drinking water quality is affected. In, uh, in longer term, degraded ecosystems, mental health impacts, and uh, also uh, there are some economical impacts uh, of flooding. Uh, Malaysia is the country uh, experiencing flooding uh, too much uh, uh, during the next 50 uh, 100 year, years, uh, the flooding may increase in Malaysia uh, cities. Uh, and also in Turkey, here you see uh, uh, during the last 20 years, uh, the number of extreme weather events uh, increasing. And uh, it is reported that uh, this will continue to increase. And refugee problem, uh, it's a big problem in Asia uh, uh, continent. And in, in Middle East, in South Asia, there are different, different refugee problems. In Turkey, 5 million Syrian refugees are living in these camps. Uh, and uh, because of, uh, you know, uh, it's very dense, uh, very dense population is living in these camps. There are too many uh, uh, disease related uh, uh, with uh, living each other. Uh, oriental boils, hand food, and mouth disease, these are the frequent uh, disease found in migrants. And uh, uh, in Asia uh, report, we are uh, advising uh, to continue in analysis of solutions and sharing good practice uh, in uh, Asia uh, countries. Uh, here, adaptation uh, is very important, integrating local national uh, actions, uh, strengthening health services and other infrastructure, pub uh, increasing public awareness and education, early warning and uh, surveillance systems and control of infectious disease. In Turkey, uh, the national program uh, and action plan uh, on climate change and health approved in uh, January uh, 2015 uh, by the Minister of Health. And uh, there are uh, four uh, working groups uh, obtained uh, Health Indicator Commission, Early Warning and Response Commission, Research Orientation Planning, and Risk Management. In line with the work of co commissions, targets uh, were set, strategies were determined, and activities were listed. And here, uh, there are too many training uh, meetings, uh, congresses, uh, on water and health, about urban environment during the last uh, uh, five years. Uh, 
And also uh, there are uh, studies by the Minister of Environment on education modules of climate change. And uh, there, are, uh, there is one module is related with the climate change and health in these education modules. There are also very good case studies uh, on uh, early warning uh, uh, system uh, at the south uh, uh, west of Turkey in uh, one city in Aydın. Uh, there is, is a pilot uh, study of early warning of climate change. Uh, uh, with this uh, project, uh, web page uh, is uh, organized and uh, during uh, with uh, with this project sms messages is sent to the people uh, for the extreme uh, weathers and at the end of the study uh, it was observed that the stimulation of digital media creates awareness in the uh, participants and positively affects their attitudes and behaviors. Uh, steps for Turkey's adaptation process, uh, trainings is very important uh, for the uh, future and uh, studies of, on health sensitive uh, groups uh, should be uh, increased, uh, it's very important. And uh, here you see health sensitive living on street, homeless, uh, uh, living without social support, infant, child, elderly, pregnant, women, groups uh, with uh, dysfunction. Early warning systems should be uh, also developed for all uh, region. It's very important uh, to decrease the effect of climate change. Local level arrangements and activities should be uh, urgently adopted and the awareness raising should be uh, given priority. The emergency response mechanisms should uh, also be uh, de developed. The another important uh, thing is, uh, is an uh, information. Uh, I, I think um, there is a lack of statistical information about climate-related uh, disasters. Uh, that's why there, uh, the establishment of center or institute on uh, these should be uh, uh, okay, should be done. And uh, this is my uh, last slide. Uh, and uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Uh, and if you have a question, I will be very happy to answer. Yes, thank you also, Professor Kuyunchi, for this presentation on uh, the Asian region. Um, now we have scheduled a few minutes for immediate questions um, from the audience that may have come up. And I already saw that we had one question, which I would like maybe to direct to Robin. Robin, if you could turn on uh, your video. Yes, thank you. Um, so Kathleen Michaels is asking about um, the role of plastic production. She says plastic production and use is a huge driver of climate change throughout the life cycle, including emitting methane and ethylene, eth ethylene, sorry, if I did not pronounce this correctly, uh, when exposed to uh, sunlight, and she's asking for a comment on this. Hey, th th thank you um, for the question. Thank you, Joanna. Um, um, I think, yes, we can, we can all agree that um, plastics uh, production and use uh, generate a, a number of challenges to society in terms of um, manufacturing processes and, and climate change, as you mentioned, and also, of course, uh, contributing to other environmental damage. Um, in fact, we've had recent work by ESAC, uh, European Academy Network, um, to look at issues for plastic pollution. Uh, details on your screen now. Um, and I'd refer you to that work um, for further detail, more broadly about issues for plastics use. Um, 
I, I'd make two other points, I just very briefly. One is I, I think um, the issue for plastics exemplifies uh, one of the issues that we're emphasizing throughout this meeting, the need to integrate objectives and actions across sectors. Um, so an interest in health doesn't mean uh, merely action within the health sector, um, but, taking, but also taking account of health and, and other issues in other sectoral action for manufacturing, for energy, for agriculture, and so on. And that applies equally to plastic production. But the second specific point um, is that um, the health sector itself is a big user, user of single-use plastic products, disposed and, and uh, not recycled. Um, and health systems themselves are rapidly beginning to address their own carbon footprints um, with ambitions to uh, decarbonize in the UK. We, we have a pioneering position from our NHS, but um, good practice is being shared amongst institutions worldwide in the health sector. And amongst a, a lot of the embedded carbon in the healthcare sector is the supply chain, including the supply chain of single-use plastic products. So there's a great need, um, specifically within the health sector, to, to look at the opportunities for recycling or, or replacing plastic products. Um, and the European Academies will be publishing a uh, commentary on the health sector decarbonization, decarbonization within the next month or so. Uh, so I urge you to look forward to seeing that. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Um, Donna Hackley is asking about the specific references. Um, Christiane Deal already posted uh, one reference, the reference to the ESIC report in the chat. So you can take a look at this. And if you need any further reference, we're also happy to pro provide them with you. Just send us an email and we can share this with you. And then we all have also one question to Professor uh, um, if you could turn on your um, camera. Um, the question is, um, is heat related illness a major issue in the Asian region? If you could answer to that. Uh, yes, uh, uh, there are some reports uh, uh, and point on this issue. Uh, with, uh, there may be direct heat effects and also indirect heat effects. With direct heat effects, there are some statistical uh, uh, informations with the, uh, uh, according to these informations at high temperatures, the mortality uh, uh, numbers are increasing. And also there are some reports uh, reporting the, some cardiovascular uh, disease uh, uh, with uh, during summer season uh, they are uh, in increasing yes we can say that uh, heat uh, is uh, affecting uh, the uh, illnesses thank you for this answer professor kunchu in view of the time i will keep the other questions that were raised for now um, you might be able to address them later or give an answer just in the Q&A tool. Um, thank you already for the questions asked so far, so far. And now we are moving to the other two world regions that we haven't covered yet. And we will start with the Americas. And for that, I will share my screen once again to uh, show you the presentation given by um, Shirley Harper. My name is Sherry Lee Harper, and I'm a Canada Research Chair in Climate Change and Health at the University of Alberta in Canada. And it's such a pleasure to be here today to tell you about our report on climate change and health, which focuses specifically in on the Americas. And I'm here today on behalf of a much larger team, which is co-led by Dr. Jeremy McNeil, as well as a number of other steering committee members from countries across the Americas, including Argentina, Brazil, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Mexico, and the United States, and our team is growing every day. Like elsewhere around the world, climate change is having a variety of different impacts across the Americas. 
From the IPCC fifth assessment report, there were projections of increased temperature across the Americas, and specifically in North America, we're expecting to see a two to four fold increase in the frequency of heat wave events by the end of the century, as well as increases in precipitation and heavy rainfall, especially in the northern regions of North America, and increases in drought frequency in the southern regions of North America. And we know that every single bit of warming matters in the Americas. Here in these graphs, you can see um, climate futures under 1.5 degrees of global warming versus two degrees of global warming. And we can see a pretty substantial increase in the change in average temperature of the hottest days. We also see a huge change in the average temperature of the coldest nights in the Americas. For example, in the Caribbean, warm spells will occur 50% of the year under 1.5 degrees of warming, and that will increase to almost 70% of the year under two degrees of warming. In the Arctic, under uh, 1.5 degrees of global warming, we would expect to see an ice-free summer once every 100 years, but under two degrees of warming, that would increase to once every 10 years. These are substantial changes that have huge implications for cultures, for society, and for human health. And the impacts to human health from climate change are incredibly diverse throughout the Americas. When our team sat down to try and decide what we were going to focus on and how we were going to um, shape our report, we were faced with a huge challenge. The Americas have a diversity of projected future climate changes. We have a diversity of different climates. We have a diversity of cultures and languages. We have different political systems. We have differences in access to resources including high, middle, and low-income countries. And we also have different underlying health challenges. And these all impact how climate change is going to impact um, the health of people in the Americas going into the future. And so we felt that this challenge was huge. And we really questioned how we were going to do this concisely and effectively and in a way that was useful for policymakers and decision makers. So how did we do this? So what we decided to do was focus on climate change and health syntheses, and these include both international assessment reports, national assessment reports, right down to local level assessment reports on climate change and health. We also drew a lot on systematic literature reviews as a source of evidence. To advance where previous reports had left off, um, we decided to really uh, provide a strengthened emphasis on the local context and also impacts of non-climatic variables. This included in-depth case studies to highlight regional climate health impacts and responses. We decided we really wanted to have a very strong focus on equity. We decided to prioritize Indigenous peoples and Indigenous knowledge in our report. And we also wanted to really highlight community-based research approaches um, throughout the Americas. So in our report, we have um, two main sections. The first section focuses on the health impacts, and the second section focuses on synthetic um, recommendations for adaptation and mitigation. In the health section of the report, we look at health outcome by health outcome, and we look at the current status and impacts with examples. We also look at different projected impacts on health outcomes, and we look at those under different climate change scenarios. We look at those under different adaptation uh, scenarios and strategies, as well as under different shared socioeconomic pathways forward. We also look at adaptation and mitigation strategies that are specific to those health outcomes to add a level of depth and granularity. And finally, we look at case studies. And the case studies really help illustrate what climate change impacts on health look like and what they feel like on the ground throughout the Americas. So here are some examples of the different health outcomes that we focused on. We looked at how um, climate change is impacting heat-related morbidity and mortality and the different morbidities range from things like heat exhaustion to heat stroke um, to cardiovascular challenges, um, the more typical things that you might think of when you think about heat exposure and, and heat stress. But we also look at the more not so common to think of health outcomes that are related to heat exposure. And that includes things like low birth weights, um, as well as increased suicide. For instance, we look at case study examples in the United States, Mexico, and Brazil, where increased heat exposure led to increased rates of suicide. We're also looking at respiratory health and wellness, and this is a result of things like exposure to pollution, as well as things like increased exposure to aerial allergens, among other things, with specific examples from the West Coast in Canada on how increased wildfires are also increasing respiratory distress. 
We're looking at different infectious diseases, including waterborne disease, foodborne disease, vectorborne disease. We have a section on nutrition and food security with specific examples throughout South America and Central America, but also examples um, from Indigenous communities throughout the Americas. For instance, Indigenous communities on the west coast of Canada really rely on seafood as a primary source of nutrients and nutrition for, for those local communities. And we know that under climate change, um, seafood availability will significantly decrease because of warming waters. And this will lead to a 21% decline in nutrient intake for those communities. However, under a high mission scenario, this nutrient uh, decrease in nutrient intake will actually increase to 32% reduction. We have a substantial section on mental health and wellness. And this is a cross-cutting health impact because um, mental, uh, climate change impacts mental health in a number of different ways. And finally, we also look at climate disasters, including injuries and unintentional death. But across all of these health impacts, what we really try to illustrate in the America's report is cross-cutting themes of how all these different health outcomes are actually modified or mediated by things like equity, gender, um, indigenous knowledge systems, um, as well as our ability to meet the sustainable development goals. So across these different health outcomes, we're looking at how the social determinants of health modify or mediate how climate change will be impacting the health of populations in the Americas. In the second half of the report, we're looking at uh, adaptation and mitigation solutions with regards to health outcomes. Specifically under adaptation, we're looking um, and showcasing and highlighting different adaptation assessment tools that decision makers can use to assess how climate change will impact health. So this includes things like the BRACE framework, which was created by the CDC in the United States, also looking at different vulnerability and impact assessment um, tools that are available. Really importantly, we're trying to use the literature and evidence available to interrogate the efficacy of different adaptation options and responses. And this is really an emerging area of research, um, and it has really important implications for decision makers deciding which adaptation strategy actually yields um, the, the best health outcomes in, in the context of climate change. In this section, we also address the limits of adaptation. We're also looking at the impacts of mitigation on health outcomes, because it isn't enough anymore to just adapt to increase um, temperatures and ch changing climates into the future, we also have to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions substantially. So in our report, we look at the co-benefits to different health outcomes. For example, we have a case study in Mexico City that examines different methods and different approaches or tools that are being proposed that would reduce the heat island effect for that city and, their, uh, and increase uh, health benefits but also reduce greenhouse gas emissions for the city. We're also asking the question, can health benefits motivate mitigation actions? So for instance, could uh, COVID-19 considerations um, and ex economic stimulus packages incentivize decarbonization? And what does that mean in the context of health? As we went through our report and we assessed the evidence, we also highlighted research gaps. And there were important uh, gaps in geographical coverage. Specifically, certain countries and regions were less uh, covered than others. Um, the United States definitely dominates the literature on climate change impacts and health for the Americas. There's less research in Canada, even less in Mexico, and even less in Central and in South America. There's also important gaps between, uh, between urban and rural areas, with a lot less research coming out of rural areas. We also identified gaps um, in research that looked at different social factors and how those social factors uh, mediated or modified the way climate change impacts different health outcomes. We found that most research focused on the exposure response relationship between climate change and different health outcomes. We found less research that looked at how those associations might change into the future under different climate change scenarios. And we found even less research that looked at how um, climate change might impact different health outcomes under different adaptation scenarios, as well as under different uh, shared socioeconomic pathways. And based on this, I think it's really important that as researchers, we start to shift our focus um, from filling in those exposure response research gaps that exist in the literature 
to also really focusing on projections and looking forward at how climate change might impact health into the future, in particular under different adaptation scenarios and under different um, socioeconomic structures moving forward. What was really interesting was that when we started the report, we identified our the geographic range that we had to cover as a huge challenge for us. How on earth could we possibly provide a concise um, assessment on climate change impacts on health when the geography was so different, when the cultures were so different, when the climate change projections were so different? But what we soon came to realize was that um, the diversity that exists within the Americas is actually a strength of our report. Because despite this widespread diversity across the Americas, there are also a number of common underlying pathways through which climate change impacts health. And we were able to comment on some of those more generalized um, learnings um, that, that comes from the literature and can inform um, decision making moving forward. So what initially started out as our huge challenge actually turned into the huge strength of this particular report and something that we're really excited about. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And I really do look forward to the discussions and the, the breakout groups. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Shirley, for this presentation on the situation in the Americas. And um, this leads me to our last presentation from the regions, which is on Africa. And I will also share my screen with you for this one. Great. One second. And as always, feel free to ask any questions in the Q&A tool. Those will be addressed right after this presentation. Greetings. My name is Dr. Deoraz Kosi, and it's my pleasure to present to you the regional perspective on climate change and health for Africa. As you know, the African continent is the most vulnerable to the impact of climate change, despite being the least emitter of greenhouse gases. Why is that situation? Well, first of all, the due to the vulnerability that we have. 60% of our land mass is dry land, 38% of which is desert, 50% of the population live in the arid, semi-arid, and dry, humid, and desert lands. On top of that, we have low adaptive capacity caused by high rates of poverty and technological constraint. Now, the climate change have resulted in a number of climatic hazards, such as rising temperature, extreme weather condition, sea level rise, that result in a number of health consequences, including cardiovascular diseases, infectious diseases, undernutrition, and NCD. The map on the center shows the vulnerability is not evenly distributed across the continent, but because the topology and the social determinant are different at different locations. To illustrate this, I've chosen a few examples. The first one I've chosen is the impact of rising temperature. Africa has been described as a continent on fire. The inset map on the left-hand side illustrate the number of heat days that were projected due to modeling in 1960 and in the year 20 in, in the inset B. The main impact of this uh, increase in number of heat days will result in number of deaths that can be attributable to the increase in heat. This will be particularly felt in sub-Saharan Africa east and west as shown on the table on the left hand side. Other major impact that will result will be cardiovascular diseases, increased occupational hazard such as uh, in outdoor jobs such as mining, agriculture, which form a major part of our economy. And that will lead to decrease human productivity, of course, will exacerbate poverty. Do we have any solution? Well, we can start to model the health impact. So we can anticipate it. We can insulate houses by using in-house green technologies, the public building and houses. And on the health side, we can institute early warning system and strengthen the health system to cope with the added burden. The other example I've chosen is the impact on vector bone diseases. I chose malaria as an example. The four inset graph on the left hand side, 
the topmost two shows the temperature fluctuation with time, and the two bottom one shows the number of relative density of mosquito reflecting those temperature changes. The two, the temperature change and the density of mosquito mirror each other. In other words, when the temperature goes up, the number of mosquitoes goes up. Then we have on the left, on the right hand side with the projection on number of uh, days that are susceptible to the multiplication of the malaria mosquito. This projection for the world, and you can see on the top of that is Africa in the blue, dark blue uh, line. What impact it will have? Well, it will have impact on other vectors. Malaria is just one of it. That we have other vector bone diseases like yellow fever, dengue, chikungunya, Zika, but, and then we have the Rift Valley fever that has both, uh, affect both people and animals. Therefore, that can affect livelihood and food security, in addition to the other medical complications. What solution do we have? We can use, like the, in the case of heat, we can do modeling, institute early warning system, strengthen health system. But to deal with vector bone disease, we have to approach it in an integrated management of vectors strategy, for which we need to institute and implement the health in all policy. The other example I've chosen is agriculture and food security. 60% of the food supply are locally grown, and the rest are from other imports or from food aids. Now, climate change will negatively impact food crop production for the world, as shown in the map, global map, but Africa is right in the middle there, so Africa will also be negatively impacted. The main climate change is flood, drought, and pest, they will lead to crop failure. That will impact livelihood and food security. Of course, it will exacerbate poverty, but there will be malnutrition, and with that will be attributable death, increase of death in the sub-Saharan East and West region. Absence of readily available healthy carbohydrate source will drive the population toward high energy dense food by the year 2030 that will put an additional 118 million people at increased risk for all NCD. Do we have any solution? Well, we can change the farming practice. We can change the dietary habit, such as consuming less protein and looking for new sources of food like insects and microproteins. Now, our research have identified a number of cross-cutting themes that is common to all the sectors. We promote the use of modeling that will enable us to do a vulnerability assessment. We also promote collaborative research that will enable us to establish the co-benefit of mitigation and adaptation strategies, an area that is we have very few information for Africa. We also highly endorse the public health package, strengthening the health system, instituting early warning system, and we endorse including climate change in the disaster risk reduction. And also incorporating health in the national adaptation plan. We have to look for alternative technologies that I've already mentioned some of them, like uh, planting fire resistant food, uh, trees, and depending less on the domestic uh, solid fuel. We need to endorse uh, the policy support at all level. However, we have persistent challenges. We are weak health system with limited resilience to detect, monitor, and treat climate sensitive diseases. We have limited experts most experts are outside Africa, so we get to promote partnership and research. And then we have the ever constant threat of emerging diseases. We have the impact of Ebola, cholera, and now COVID-19. In face of all this, we have to rebuild a green economy. So we're dealing with a triple burden of communicable diseases, non-communicable diseases, and disaster due to climate change. In conclusion, Climatic hazards and health impact are present to harmful level in Africa. Our strategies to mitigate and adapt are limited. Unmitigated climate change will widen the inequity gap, will harm attaining universal health coverage, will slow down attaining SDG, and therefore we need to partner in this quest 
is a battle that we cannot fight alone. I thank you for your attention. Yes, I would also like to thank you, dear Raj, for this presentation on Africa. And now I would like to ask all the speakers who have just presented to please turn on your videos um, so we can go into a panel discussion um, with any um, answering any questions that the attendees may have. So attendees, this is your, your chance, your time. If you have any questions to the um, speakers that have just presented, or if you have any other issue that hasn't been addressed that you think needs mention at this point, please, please uh, use the Q&A tool um, to pose these questions. Um, at the moment, there is one question left uh, in the Q&A from before. Um, oh, yeah, actually, there's a new question. Um, this is, I guess, directly to Diraj. Uh, and the question is, why is Africa described as a continent on fire despite being the least emitter of greenhouse gases? And what is the solution? Diraj, if you could unmute. You want me to answer that now? Yeah. Yes, if you could, that would be. Would you like me to answer that now? Okay. Well, it's uh, there are two things I said. One is we are the least emitter of gas, but we're the most uh, receiver of the brunt of climate change. The other one we say we climate we can't on fire because of the burning of the bushfires, of the coal, of the sort of the uh, domestic fuel uh, wood. So we are, and then our deserts always are lit up. So we has been described by one of the authors. We are continent on fire. And then we get the flaring of the gases in the West, in the Delta of Nigeria and all those. So taken together, it's a more of a, but we do have a big contribution of bushfires and, uh, and heat. And do you also have any um, ideas on, on what could be the solution to the continent on fire uh, being a problem as the, yeah. We get a look for we get a look for mitigation and adaptation. Uh, get a source where we are emitting those uh, fires. We get to reduce them. Like what I mentioned is planting fire resistant trees, but it's easier said than done. Then you can bring in you can disrupt the local ecology and bring maybe pest uh, uh, trees. But the other one is to change the pattern of uh, domestic use of fuel. Uh, we get clean stove as opposed to using those coal. And then again, the savannah, we get, to, we get to address the savannas where most of the fires take place, also bushfires, to contain it in such a way that we have fireproof and corridors so the fire doesn't spread. We get to go to, to the, from the policy to right to the citizen. We get, to get the citizen interested because they are the one who are doing on the field. Mm -hmm. And that knowledge, a gap, there's a gap in there. Okay. Um, yes, there are a few more questions for dear Raj, but um, maybe dear Raj, you can already take a look at them in the Q&A tool. And uh, while you do so, there is a question um, also to other speakers. And I would like to maybe ask Andy Haynes now to um, take over the moderation um, of the panel discussion. Um, so Andy, um, an anonymous uh, attendee is asking, what is your opinion um, to those who are still not, do not believe in climate change? Um, so if, if the, do you also have a message to those or is this not addressed at all in, in the report? Shall I direct that to one of the, uh, one of the panelists? Yes, that would be great. Uh, may, maybe then I'll ask uh, Shirley to, to respond to that. I mean, how does one address this issue of climate change denial? Because skepticism is something we're all familiar with in science. Science is about organized skepticism, but there are some people who are still denying the facts of climate change. Should we try to address them? And how, if so, how? Yeah, I think that's a really good good question. And as you mentioned, as, as scientists, we, we deal with this um, across topics, and we're certainly seeing that with the COVID pandemic right now as well. 
Um, I, th I think there's a lot of different ways you, you could address this. So um, I'll kick us off, but other panelists might have other suggestions as well. I think um, one of the, the tools that, that I personally use uh, most commonly is, is I try to find a little bit of common ground with the person that I'm speaking with. So for instance, um, I, I try to, to, to learn more about them. So my, my grandfather actually was a climate change denier for a very long time. He was, he was a farmer. And um, one thing that finally sort of opened his eyes to the idea of, of how the extent to which the climate was changing was looking at the farmer's almanacs and looking at how those were changing over the years and how, you know, what and when he could grow and, and plant things was, was actually changing. So that's an example of, of, of speaking to people on a personal level. If I'm speaking to someone who maybe is an, um, somebody who really likes to exercise outside a lot, um, maybe somebody who does like marathons or something like that. Um, in the city of Edmonton, where, where I'm located right now in Canada, we experience a lot of um, uh, air pollution due to forest fires, which is, is increasing uh, with climate change. Um, and so talking to them about what it's like to be running outside in those conditions um, and, and how it impacts them and, and their health and, and their day-to-day -day decision making. So trying to bring it down to them on, on a personal level can be really effective, but there are a lot of different ways that, that you can um, um, grapple with this. And there's a really good TED talk um, by Catherine Hayhoe on, on this topic that I'd recommend people to check out um, online as well. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Ismail, could I also turn to you and ask whether uh, this is also an issue in, in Turkey? How do you deal with climate change denial or extreme levels of skepticism which go beyond the normal boundaries of scientific uh, discussion and doubt? Could you, say, could you ask again? Excuse me. Uh, the, 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 some people are denying that climate change is happening. They're saying it's not happening um, and therefore we don't need to do anything about it. Is this an issue in your experience in Turkey? How does the science community in Turkey react to people who say climate change is not happening, we don't need to do anything? Uh, actually, uh, in Turkey, uh, in universities, in resource centers, we, are, uh, we have um, resource centers uh, on climate change. And they are working on this, uh, Minister of Environment, and also Minister of Health uh, now uh, is uh, doing uh, some studies and taking some actions on this. I think uh, uh, people uh, who is not living climate change, change is, uh, 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 is at a very low ratio. Uh, I think it's happening because during the last uh, 20 years, uh, uh, extreme weathers increased too much. Uh, and uh, I think we are experiencing it nowadays. Yes. Thank you. Yes, I, I, I think there is probably, um, certainly in many parts of the world, a, probably a decline in people who are actually saying it's not happening because it's now obvious that it is. There are some people who say it's not due to human activities, but there I think also is declining because the evidence is so strong. But there will always be a few people who will deny reality. Uh, and I think that uh, probably uh, we, we can't spend too much time on this very small proportion of people who are going to deny reality, yeah. whatever, you, whatever you say to them. But uh, it is an important issue for scientific communication, I think, and particularly yeah. working with younger people, uh, with school children, with uh, university students, early career researchers. They're often better informed, I think, uh, than middle-aged and, and older people who don't have such a good scientific uh, background. So a very, very important issue. Um, are there any other, oh, there's one question about the Amazon. Now we don't actually have anyone here um, from, um, from Brazil, but there is a question about the Amazon and what the effects are in the Amazon. Shirley, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, sure. The Amazon um, is, is covered in our uh, America's report. And it's a, it's a very interesting place, actually, because it's, well, first of all, it's, it's huge. Um, but also, it's, it, uh, depending on the area of the Amazon, um, the, the climate change projections are really quite different. In some areas, we're expecting to see um, substantial decreases in um, precipitation and drought, which could lead to, to tipping points um, and desert, desertification. Um, but in other areas of the Amazon, we're expecting to see um, a lot more precipitation falling and uh, huge uh, flooding events and much more stream, extreme um, El Nino events as well. 
So the Amazon is this really interesting place where we're seeing a huge diversity and wide range of climate change impacts on the local ecosystems and environments. And that has a huge range of impacts on health. Um, everything um, from, from flooding events, which could increase risk of injury, um, to increase waterborne disease. Um, a lot of different vector-borne diseases are of concern right now. Um, uh, nutrition, especially in indigenous communities where local food sources are changing substantially because of those environmental changes. Um, heat stress and heat stroke, um, you name it, um, considering the huge area of the Amazon and the wide diversity of climate change impacts, we're expecting to see a wide range of health impacts, some of which have already started to manifest in the area. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Shirley. Yes, I mean, and of course, the other big concern is that the Amazon starts to shift from being a net sink of carbon to being a source of carbon. And once that happens, and it may be happening, uh, you know, now or very soon, then the danger is that that can't be reversed. Uh, so uh, it is a very important part of the world, both because of the uh, its potential importance for the for the world's climate, uh, but also because it's undergoing uh, really unprecedented rates. Or they've now started to go up again, the levels of, of deforestation. I know we're running out of time. Just very one other very quick question that's come through about the difference between urban and rural populations and the different vulnerability. Uh, maybe I'll turn to Robin there. Do you want to comment on that, Robin? The difference between uh, urban and rural populations. Well, yeah. Uh, Okay, what one clear um, concern for the urban populations it is the potential for cities to act as heat, heat islands uh, where the local temperature in it, within a city is higher than in the surrounding countryside. Uh, this may well exacerbate um, some, some of the impacts of climate on health with regard to uh, direct heat related morbidity, morbidity and mortality. Um, and, and we've seen that in some of the European data uh, for heat waves, uh, and I think it's found around the world. Um, so, so that's what one issue. Um, that there are other um, perhaps confounding factors or, or, or other mediators that need to be taken into account. So, for example, in, in rural areas, um, impacts may be particularly high. Um, on those working outside subsistence farmers, for example, and uh, and your own work on um, heat and humidity induced uh, problems for, for labour um, clearly may have more of an effect on, on some rural populations than their urban populations, um, because uh, urban populations may be able to work inside and, and apply air conditioning, but of course that creates its, its own problems. Um, so, so I think the short answer to the question um, is, is that there may well be distinct problems both for urban areas and, and rural areas, but broadly everybody um, is sharing to some, some degree uh, that the adverse health impacts of climate change worldwide. Uh, thanks very much, Robin. And there are a couple of other questions in the Q&A which we don't have time to address at the moment. One of them is, is to you. Um, uh, Rob, Robin, about the types of organisms released from the uh, ice you know, in the Arctic region. So perhaps you could just answer that by uh, in writing. And there's yeah. one of the opportunities to collaborate with health professional organisations, which uh, maybe Shirley could respond to in writing. But I'll also mention it very briefly in my in my presentation as well. So I think Johanna probably ought to get on with my presentation and try and keep it short because I know you want to try and get back on on time. So let me uh, share my uh, share my slides very quickly. Hopefully, you can see my presentation. Can you? Yes. Yeah. Good. So what I'm going to say very briefly is to give you a kind of overview of some of the um, current issues around policy, climate change, and health and policy. Obviously, quite a strong focus on COP26 in Glasgow because that's an upcoming event this year, which is really focusing uh, public, um, scientific, and political attention on climate change, and we hope climate change uh, and health uh, as well. So, um, although we don't yet know whether Glasgow will be a completely uh, in-person event or whether it will have a, a very a partly virtual uh, element, which I suspect it will. 
Um, clearly, there is going to be a major event in Glasgow um, in November. Uh, there will be a conference in early November organized by the World Health Organization and the Global uh, Climate and Health Alliance uh, on, um, on health and climate change. That will be outside the official kind of conference uh, boundaries. There'll also be a range of events in the green zone, which is open to the public, and the blue zone, which is open to the negotiators and official delegates uh, on health and climate change, but they haven't been selected yet, so we don't know what they will be. So the UK government has a number of campaigns in the run-up to COP26. There are five main campaigns that are shown on this slide. Um, one of them is adaptation and resilience, which is to encourage greater political ambition, finance and tools on adaptation and resilience. The second is the energy transition, seizing the opportunity to decarbonize the energy system quickly uh, because of it partly capitalizing on the rapidly falling renewable price. Clean transport, accelerating the transition to zero carbon road transport, phasing out petrol and diesel engines. Nature, protecting and restoring natural habitats um, <clears throat> to act as uh, partly to contribute to climate change adaptation, but also uh, mitigation as well. And then of course, uh, finance, which is absolutely crucial to achieve many of the uh, COP26 objectives. So transforming the financial system to reflect the need for rapid action on climate change. And of course, in, the term, in terms of health, investing in climate resilient health systems, but also decarbonizing the health systems themselves. And I'll mention that uh, briefly. So none of these are specifically um, on health, but they all have very important health implications, as you can see from the bottom of the slide. Healthy transport systems can improve health through reduced air pollution, increased physical activity. Uh, nature and ecosystems can have a number of uh, beneficial effects uh, on, on health, including mental health um, and physical health. So lots to be done integrating health into these five broad campaign themes. And we also understand that increasingly and somewhat belatedly, the British government is also seeing health as an important component. So as, although it's not part of the five official campaign aims, uh, it will have a much higher profile at this COP than it has under previous COPs not just the health benefits of decarbonizing the economy and better adaptation strategies, uh, but also what can be done in the healthcare system. So in terms of adaptation and resilience, uh, there's going to be a lot of work building on the call, uh, which has been very widely endorsed by over a hundred countries for action on adaptation and resilience, increasing the availability and efficiency and accessibility of adaptation and resilience finance and reducing the cost of disasters uh, stimulating and catalyzing urgent on the ground adaptation. It's important to say that many adaptation strategies don't really consider health. And that's really dangerous because sometimes that results in maladaptation. In other words, adaptation, which actually has unintended adverse consequences, either by increasing greenhouse gas emissions, like for example, increasing air conditioning. If you just put lots of air conditioning in, you may reduce heat related deaths, but you'll also increase the load on the electric grid you will increase emissions of greenhouse gases, and you will increase the urban heat island because you've got to pump the heat somewhere, you pump it outside the buildings. So integrating um, health into adaptation is crucial. There's the energy transition campaign, which has four elements, most urgently phasing out of coal power because we know that 80% of coal has to remain in the ground if we have a reasonable chance of keeping well below two degrees, which is what the Paris Agreement tells us we should do. That means reducing international coal uh, financing, uh, preventing and reducing the contribution of the financial sector to investments in coal. And of course, capitalizing on the declining costs of renewable energy, particularly photovoltaics, but also wind energy as well, um, which are increasingly competitive with coal. And if we stopped subsidizing fossil fuels, as unfortunately we do, we don't pay the full economic cost of them, then of course, renewables will be able to contribute and, and, and uh, compete much more effectively. So establishing this new financial framework to take us away, particularly from coal, but also oil and gas is going to be crucial. Clean transport, obviously underpinned by the health considerations. Emissions from cars and vans make up about 7% of the global total at the moment, but it is increasing very rapidly as more countries uh, take on board and, and increase their use of the private car. So there needs to be a rapid global shift to zero emission vehicles in the UK. Um, they're, they're using the COP26 presidency 
to try and push for all, make, making all cars uh, zero emission by 2040. But in cities, of course, particularly, we need to emphasize the need to use public transport rather than everyone driving their own car, but also promoting active travel, walking and cycling, because physical inactivity is also a major killer. About 5 million people a year on average die of physical inactivity, die of diseases caused by physical inactivity. So big uh, benefits from that. Nature, we now appreciate nature has such an important role in human health, both mental and physical health. And the COP26 nature campaign aims to build a new dialogue on sustainable land use, reducing deforestation, reducing um, agricultural monocultures, um, and uh, investing in sustainable production, new markets for more sustainable crops, delivering increased finance for nature-based solutions. Nature-based solutions can be very varied, everything from wetland protection, uh, mangrove, for example, which can reduce flood risks, protection of forests to reduce biodiversity loss and also reduce air pollution from wildfires, and so on. But designing these nature-based solutions with health in mind is important because if you design them badly, you can make health worse. So for example, if you protect wetlands close to cities, they can harbor disease carrying mosquitoes, which can increase the risk of disease. So one needs to always think about health when designing adaptation strategies. And you can see that it isn't just land, also the ocean's role is increasingly recognized. The ocean is a major sink for CO2, and it helps to, it's also a heat sink as well. And there are important implications of some of the ocean strategies around fisheries, uh, more sustainable use of um, shellfish, uh, crops, uh, seaweed, and so on um, from marine sources can also benefit health directly and indirectly. We're also realizing the healthcare sector is a major emitter. If the healthcare sector was a country, it would be the fifth largest emitter of greenhouse gases on the planet. Um, and uh, NHS England has now committed to net zero emissions by 2040 for these direct emissions, for the fossil fuels that are built, uh, that are burnt, sorry, on the sites of hospitals and other healthcare facilities, and 2045 for indirect emissions. So the electricity that it buys in, the transport that uh, transports patients and staff to health facilities, and of course, pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceuticals are very energy intensive as well, producing pharmaceuticals and medical equipment. So working on procurement policies, working with the private sector to ensure that they decarbonize their supply chains is an important part of decarbonizing the health sector, as well as reducing um, single use uh, plastics and other materials, um, moving towards uh, asthma inhalers, for example, which don't contain climate active substances, uh, moving towards powder inhalers and a range of other sub uh, subjects. So in conclusion, um, as you know, um, each country is supposed to present its nationally determined contributions. Um, it's going to be is doing so over over coming months. Actually, a, bit, a little bit delayed, but it's supposed to be. Many countries are have done so or are doing so. These nationally contributions reflect their contribution to reductions in greenhouse gas emissions for the Paris Climate Agreement, and we know that there's also an opportunity to integrate health into these nationally determined contributions. And the publication on the slide uh, illustrates some of the work that WHO has been doing with national governments to increase the integration of health in these NDCs with the aim of accelerating ambition for decarbonization by capitalizing on the health benefits of lowered air pollution and some of the other benefits we've talked about as well. So using these NDCs and the health benefits of the NDCs to increase the ambition um, to decarbonize the economy is an important goal over coming months. And so in conclusion then, there's a real opportunity for health voices to be engaged in this so-called race to zero, which is a coalition of 120 countries, over a thousand businesses, many universities and cities, which have undertaken to decarbonize their activities over coming decades, we need to uh, reached net zero by 2050. Unfortunately, we, we know that the current NDCs and the nat nationally determined contributions are not sufficient to enable us to get to zero in that time period. So the voice of health professionals is going to be really important. And one of the questions in the Q&A uh, function was, what role can health professionals play and how can we get involved? And there are a number now of activities 
both through the conventional um, health professional bodies, the World Medical Association and others, but also through networks like the Global Climate and Health Alliance, GCHA, which you can find on Google, which, um, which also coordinates a whole range of health professional organizations around the world. And that's important because nurses and doctors are amongst the most trusted members of society. So when they advocate for rapid action, it's more likely that the public and opinion, opinion formers and decision makers uh, will take note. So I'll stop there, Johanna, and I'll hand back to you to introduce the breakout sessions. Yes, thank you very much, um, Andy, for this presentation on the policy issues that we currently face or the developments that we have seen in the last um, years. Um, Andy, if you could stop sharing your screen, then yes, thank you very much. So um, now we will, as I already said in the beginning, we would like to have a discussion, an actual discussion with the attendees. And since this is not possible in the format of a Zoom webinar, we would now like to provide a room for exchange um, in a separate Zoom meeting. We will, in the Zoom meeting, we will then have four groups, which will discuss either mitigation or adaptation solutions. Um, all attendees will be assigned to these groups randomly. Um, all of the groups will have a moderator who will guide the discussions, and we also have rapporteurs who will report back to the webinar once the breakout sessions have ended. Now, the most important information for you all is how do you join these breakout groups? So my colleague Annika will now post in the chat a link, which we ask you kindly to click on after I finish uh, talking. And um, this link will lead you to leave this Zoom webinar and to join another Zoom meeting. Um, and in this meeting, we will then be able to have the breakout discussion. Um, the breakout discussion will last for 30 minutes and afterwards you will all return to this webinar for a final discussion. Um, the, the breakout sessions will start in eight minutes. So at um, 6 p.m. CET or um, I guess this would be 11 a.m. Uh, U.S. Central Time. Um, so please join this uh, Zoom meeting now, and then you can take a break, get some coffee, get some tea, and then we will start with the breakout sessions uh, in eight minutes. And so see you all in a bit in the other Zoom meeting. Um, so I think I will now hand over to, to Andy, who will moderate the reporting back from the breakout sessions and then also the discussion afterwards, Andy. Okay, thanks, Johanna. So I won't, I'll just call people in the kind of order they appear on my screen, if that's okay, the rapporteurs. Uh, so I think Peter is, is the first one on my screen anyway. Okay, thank you, Andy. Um, so I get the dubious honor of being the, the first rapporteur with little time to <laughs> put my thoughts in focus. Um, so just to say that we were a group, we were about, uh, let's say, seven to 10 participants, uh, moderated by, by Claudia Conales from, from the, the IEP Climate Change and Health team. And we were discussing sort of adaptation. Um, and a, a lot of the, the discussions actually focused around um, public engagement um, and how to, you know, the, this sort of top down idea of governments um, putting in place policies, even, you know, high level scientists like academies advising governments and the public what to do. Um, but there was a lot of comments, I think, um, in, insisting that community groups, um, youth groups, NGOs have to be involved in the, let's say, the co-production of policies and of, of projects in how to implement sort of adaptation responses, if you like, um, in, in cities or in rural areas or elsewhere. Um, there was a, a few examples given of, um, especially in cities, there are large data sets that probably already exist on 
um, um, qualities such as, such as air, pol air pollutants and so on, and whether these are the environmental agencies or the public health agencies, a lot of data sets that could maybe be linked together and analyzed together um, and to, to show trends, you know, what, what is going up, what is going down, um, these kind of things. So that in, in many cases, the data might be there. Um, there was also re related to this a little bit, um, many public health schools use something called community health assessments, um, where they're surveying different communities at different times to find what out what is of, of importance to them in, in the, the health arena at that particular time. And it, it was proposed that this sort of community health assessment model could be used to check on you know, even in rural areas, you know, to do with um, burning stubble in fields or drought and water shortage, things that could be related to, to climate change health issues and sort of engage the communities that way. And there was obviously the, the thought that when communities are involved in the co-generation of the solutions, those solutions are much more likely to be implemented. Um, and maybe the, the final point is, again, maybe back to the, the top-down approach, but saying that organizations, um, international organizations, especially one of the example of PAHO was mentioned in, in, the, in the Americas. It could also be applied to, to IAP in a certain way. Um, do have the power of convening um, to bring the policymakers together with the scientists to listen to the, the scientific recommendations, but also those discussions, even no matter what high level, that they should include um, community members, relevant NGOs, and so on, so that any solutions are really um, thought through and worked out together. Um, let me leave it there. Um, Thank you, Peter. Well, that's, a, that, that's a great summary and, and some really important points. And I'd like to encourage uh, those listening to start formulating some questions to the, uh, to, to the rapporteurs. Uh, uh, so please feel free to put them in the, in the, in the Q&A or in the chat. Uh, next, I think, is Bisma. Hello, everyone. So we worked on mitigation, um, and but we also kind of covered adaptation um, in one of our main questions. So the first thing we wanted to understand was um, examples of how to quantify the benefits of adaptation and mitigation. Um, so we discussed there were a number of approaches that could work for this, um, measuring carbon dioxide and other pollutants. So for example, there is a process where you can kind of measure atmospherically um, by taking out greenhouse gas emissions from the atmosphere and other pollutants, and then have a better understanding um, of how many deaths may have then been mitigated. So that was a really interesting point. Also monitoring real-time air pollution, um, household air pollution, and then maybe even using population surveys to measure the activity at more of the local scale or even dietary intake, right? Because all of these different factors are involved. Um, we did know it may be taxing, um, but these things can be done and they can be measured. So it's important to keep that in mind and have a positive approach. Um, one of the individuals in our breakout room also talked about kind of what this all means for Sub-Saharan Africa, which we thought was a good point. Um, and one of the overarching themes that we want to understand is, right, Sometimes the places that we need to understand the most have the very least amount of data available. Um, and although there is very little data available, there is a more local level effort to understand at the African level, um, what is the data and how can we use it? And maybe within the next couple of months and years, we can have more information there. Um, there's also an opportunity here in the Sub-Saharan Africa and the rest of Africa to build um, resilient communities um, and have actual designs where we can already mitigate um, and adapt at the same time. So over the long term, Africa can establish as a more resilient kind of continent in that regard. Um, there was also a note on how the next COP may be focused more on Africa and zero carbon development there. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, the second question we focused on was kind of what Peter was talking about, about the local level, um, the general public, how, get, how can they be involved? Uh, what can we do? 
Um, so there were a lot of points noted about um, action happening at the subnational level. So mayors and local leaders being part of the action. And what is great about that kind of level is they can improve building regulations, sustain green space, um, talk about transportation in different ways and strategies to mitigate emissions, but also healthy food consumption, which I thought was really interesting. Other people or other actors that are involved, citizens groups, um, there is an approach called the zero carbon towns and settlements, which is extremely bottom up. So ways in which citizens can actually take action um, for their own kind of health within their community. Um, there's also a growing movement of healthcare professionals. And very interestingly, we had someone from Healthcare Without Harm as part of our group, and they shared with us kind of how this global NGO is involved with um, helping with the healthcare sector um, and greenhouse gas emissions or more of the climate change um, focus there. So basically, um, they can not only um, talk about the European level, but the global scale and the European level, at the very least, there is strong climate health policy. Um, but at the same time, it varies across just like within every other continent. Um, and then one thing that they did know also is that hospitals are really interested and people within the hospital level are getting involved. So although COVID has been a huge influence or um, focus within the healthcare sector, that does not mean that education hasn't, um, sorry, not education, that doesn't mean that climate change and the way we see that has been put on the back burner. And then last piece on just COVID-19, I think was a really important point that our, our breakout group made was how has that kind of changed the way that the world is operating towards climate change? And really what we wanted to know is that COVID-19 has prompted people to think about a green recovery and what that may look like. And that's maybe the last point I'll end on and how we can kind of think about um, ways in which strategies can not only support climate change, but also in a way where we're not in increasing inequalities. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Bisma, for a very uh, comprehensive summary. I'll move on to Shada now. Hello, everyone. So, we were discussing a few specific examples of how the public can get involved in both um, climate mitigation and adaptation efforts and we were looking at citizen science so how they can possibly use the social media to record things that they notice and then report it so we also more specifically went into the track and trace system, which although like faces difficulties in implementation, does have potential use for the future. So we were looking at the um, benefits of using technology and how the public can use that. We we're also looking at crowdsourcing in early warning systems, which can give a general sign of change in, for example, urban settings um, with the development of heat islands. And then we were looking more about how we can engage the public um, just as they're in a very good position to enact change. So the importance of educating the public and translating scientific knowledge as there's sometimes a disconnect between the science and action going on in the field. So we were talking about this mainly in relation to COVID but we discussed how science has a role in creating an awareness so it's important just to get that out there and explain how climate and change does affect health and there's also a benefit in using trusted figures um, who are on the front line as voices um, this was in relation to covid so for example doctors and nurses who are treating patients but this could be um, used in relation to climate change and health and then we were talking about misinformation. So we were talking about how we can spread like information using the same methods that disinformation is spread. So for example, using social media, but like when using social media, you have to be able to communicate and connect with people on their level. So the public understands and sees how it relates to them on a personal level. And you can achieve this by using relatable stories and that can counter misinformation and interests that have been pushing certain narratives. And we did brush briefly on a um, second question. So we were also looking at the local level. 
So we're talking about how it's difficult to achieve fast change on a national level. So looking at cross-sectional action might be achieved more quickly on a local level, for example, in cities by establishing like green roofs or urban agriculture in the greening of cities. But those were our main points. Great, okay, thanks very much, Shada, for another very uh, rich report uh, back. And then finally, I, I will uh, turn to Robin. Okay. Um, we, we were also quite a small group, but we had a productive discussion moderated by Nina and, and managed to answer three questions. Um, but there is some overlap with, with the three, three previous um, reports out. Um, we, we looked first at a question of um, how to think about research priorities, and we agreed um, that there were um, a lot of opportunities for addressing uncertainties. And, and of course, all, all of the regional working groups have um, explored what research priorities might be for them. Um, as Bismar said, um, what, what one of the priorities is to do more to understand about quantifying solutions, uh, to understand which adaptive or mitigation solutions are most cost effective uh, and, and can be scaled up. But, but there's also quite a big research agenda associated with knowing how to scale up from local initiatives and how to identify the obstacles uh, to implementation more broadly. Um, so, so some of the answer to, to those problems um, does indeed it, uh, re relate with involving other stakeholders. And, and as Peter mentioned, um, so also at the research level, co-design of, of projects uh, where, where farmers, indigenous communities, manufacturers and so on, do help to get buy-in fr from other stakeholders. That was the first question we, we looked at. A another question related to um, what are the options for the healthcare system itself um, to, to mitigate and adapt to climate change? Of course, was, was a topic that, that Andy introduced uh, in the context of the, the UK COP26 presidency and what the NHS is doing. And, and again, we, we agreed, um, as Shada mentioned, there is a responsibility for health professionals to lead the debate in a number of regards to, to stimulate uh, wide discussion and action um, within the healthcare system itself, from primary through to tertiary care. Um, there are a, a range of opportunities for mitigation. Um, some of these are associated with um, mitigation in other sectors, so clean transport, um, uh, greener buildings, etc. Uh, and a discussion included an example from Malaysia on, on uh, improving public transport access. Um, but the point that we emphasised was that, of course, um, mitigation in the health sector, as in other sectors, um, in addition to uh, potentially reducing greenhouse gas emissions, also may well bring uh, health benefits for the local population in engaging in the mitigation. Um, part of the discussion then went on to uh, considering opportunities uh, to gain those health benefits uh, by using new uh, healthcare delivery models, particularly digital health, um, to deliver care, um, particularly when um, uh, physical health infrastructure may be some way away in, in remote rural areas in, in the Arctic, for example. And it's observed that um, certainly COVID-19 experience has accelerated the delivery of healthcare virtually. And this is probably something um, that will remain with us a, 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 as a, a continuing mechanism. Um, also, just the last point on, on health systems, um, it's important to emphasise that um, preventive healthcare, of course, can also help to uh, reduce the carbon footprint of, of the health sector. Um, most of that relates to mitigation in, in terms of adaptation and, and the health sector. Um, example that we need to be mindful uh, when planning new healthcare facilities, for example, not to put them in the middle of floodplains. Uh, that won't help the, the adaption to uh, current and, and projected uh, future change. And the third question uh, com comes back to this issue of um, cross-sectoral action. How can we promote it? 
according to the um, concept of, of health in all policies. Again, this is something cross-sectoral that's really emphasised in all of the regional work. Um, it, it's, it's clear, um, obviously, with regard to a number of sectors, transportation is, is one that's been mentioned in urban planning. Um, the problem, uh, both for science and for policy making, is, of course, that a lot of the activity is still located in traditional silos. How do one build that joined up policy across the policy silos and build up joined up transdisciplinary science? I think when we finish with one example that seemed a, a relative, relatively timely and good example of, of cross sectoral interaction. Uh, and that's the, the emerging one between uh, sustainable food systems, nutrition, health. Um, and, and we've talked about that quite, quite a lot today, emphasised that um, solutions here do have to be context specific and culturally sensitive. Um, for, for example, it, it, in decoupling uh, livestock production from greenhouse gas emission intensity. Uh, and, and the point was that um, th this year, uh, in, in addition to COP26 and so on, but we have the UN Food Systems Summit. And this actually is, is a great opportunity for emphasizing some of these cross-sectoral issues. So, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Robin. So we're almost running out of time, but we do have a couple of questions. One on the chat uh, from Stefano, who asks about, well, mentions the importance of linking uh, global and local climate interactions and their impacts and suggest that we need a powerful platform and uh, an advanced analytical approach to doing this and that big data and AI may show some promise in this respect and um, this they could help to support uh, decision making if, if properly uh, configured. Uh, and I think the other point which is kind of the other other side of that coin is about how can we resolve from Veneta, how, how can we resolve the lack of data in sub-Saharan Africa? to better understand the effects of climate change and health at the community level. So I'm going to put those two questions to uh, the panelists and ask anyone who's interested in responding to them just quickly uh, to give their responses to those two really important questions. Anyone like to have a go? No, no takers at the moment. Um, Shall I just very briefly then respond to the one about Sub-Saharan Africa? Because we are doing quite a lot of work with our African colleagues, um, not just through the IAP work, through um, uh, with Jackie Caddo and the um, Network of African Science Academies, which Dia Raj has been uh, representing today, um, but also through other colleagues. Um, Dia Raj, do you want to come in on how we can build up capacity in, in Africa and collect data? You need to unmute yourself. Sure. Thank you. Uh, we need to, uh, my internet was also breaking down. We need to form the partnership because we are lacking in the expertise in areas like climate change, health scientists, to do the projection, to do the modeling. Uh, we depend most of it from the north or the south. So we need to enhance that collaboration between North and South. I think the academies have a big role to play in that. We start some, but they're very like isolated, like a parachute type of research. It comes, gets some data and then goes up and then I think it's done on a larger scale. So I think that's where some of the bottleneck is. Thank you. But so come just for limited purpose and not in the larger context of what good it will leave behind. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I would like to say also that there are a number of significant research assets in Africa. So there's networks like the In-Depth Network, which is a network of demographic surveillance sites that collects regular data on populations in particularly sub-Saharan Africa, some in Asia as well. And there are moves now to link some of that population health data uh, to climate. So that will, um, so for example, one of my colleagues has been working with, with uh, colleagues in Burkina Faso to link climate, agriculture and health data showing that um, increased temperatures and decreased rainfall in the future is going to have effects on child uh, stunting and, and mortality. So it is beginning to happen, not at the scale we would like to see, but it, it is beginning and it, it 
be done more. Uh, we can do more of it in the future. And then AI, I agree there is a potential. I mean, there's a lot of concern about AI, but there is also potential benefits from AI as well. One of the ways we're using that is to use AI to help with the synthesis of literature. Because when you try and do a literature research search now, you might come up with thousands of papers and it's quite difficult to screen them by hand. So we're working with colleagues in Berlin to see if we can use AI approaches to screen very large bodies of published literature to try and pull out the papers that are very relevant, or really that we want to, to focus on. So uh, that uh, I think there are there is some potential in terms of uh, systematic review, literature searching, but also the analysis of big data linking climate uh, and health data. But it's early days yet, and we're still working very much on that area. So I think we've got to come to an end. Well, it's just a few minutes to go now, uh, Johanna. And I think I should probably hand back to, to, to Volker, thanking everyone for their great presentations uh, and the rapporteurs um, from, the, from the breakout sessions. Uh, we, I think we've had a very stimulating um, afternoon. Johanna, is there anything you want to say before I hand back to Volker? Um, no, I think that's it. I also just would like to thank from my side all the speakers who were part of this and all the attendees for their questions. Um, and yeah, I will just leave the final works, words with Volker. So yeah. Thank you. Yeah. OK, everybody. I have to admit before I thank everybody that when we discuss this in our group, whether we should have such a webinar and discuss this, I personally was not sure whether we actually have enough to, to present to you. Because we started this already one and a half year ago, through COVID, everything was delayed. And uh, my, my concern was, is this really enough we can report? Would we really be attractive enough to get an interesting audience which we need to discuss? Would the breakout group actually work? And would the technology really keep going until the end and would not collapse? Well, all these questions have been answered very positively. I'm very impressed by the presentations. I really must say everyone did a fantastic job. And even the breakout group, which is so important in this discussion, and as it turned out, actually gave us additional information, which is worthwhile for our own work, was fantastic. So I would like to thank all the speakers. I would like to thank the breakout groups and the participants. And I would particularly like to thank Johanna for managing this and keeping this all always with a smile. You never got nervous. Everything worked. And I must say, we will do it again. I think thanks, everybody. I hope you can, can relax now and don't have a, another video conference right after this one. <laughs> I think for us, it's time to close it. Thank you very much. <laughs>